Hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all is well with you. Hey, it's good to see you here. Uh, this is a Thursday broadcast if you're watching me live tonight. Listen, can you do three things for me before we get started tonight? First of all, if this video blesses you, would you please put a like on it? And secondly, uh, wherever platform you're watching me on right now, would you subscribe to my YouTube channel? And third, would you invite other people to come to the YouTube channel and see what we're doing here. YouTube's new for me, it's about a month old. So if any of the videos have blessed you, please put a like on them and invite other people so that we can continue to get the gospel out. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, and I know that you do, I want you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to have basically a review lesson tonight and maybe teach you something that you don't already know. And if you do, then this is a very good refresher lesson for all of us. We're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments tonight, but I also want to show you something else special about the Ten Commandments. Now, there are two places in Scripture where you can find the Ten Commandments. First is in Exodus 20. We're going to look at that tonight for a few minutes. But you can also find them repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in case you didn't know that. What I want to do is just actually go over the Ten Commandments and just very briefly comment on some of them. This is not a full-blown Bible study in the Ten Commandments, but I wonder when it is the last time that you actually looked at the Ten Commandments and actually thought through them to see how you're doing. Because we're still supposed to pay attention to the Ten Commandments. I've actually heard people say that because the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament that we don't need to pay attention to them anymore because that's Old Testament and we live in the New Testament. Well, if you take that kind of thinking, you have a real problem because you can't just throw out the Old Testament. The Old and the New Testament fit together in one whole. And if you throw out part of the book and you only have another part of the book, you don't have the complete gospel and you don't have the complete word of God. Be that as it may, I've given you a moment to get to Exodus 20. And so let's go over very briefly what the Ten Commandments are. First of all, the first commandment in Exodus 20 is this. Let me just begin reading at the beginning of the chapter. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's commandment number one. No other gods. And, and God is telling us right there at the very beginning, don't even think about having another God. There is no other gods. Think about those, and maybe at one point you were like this. You had another God that you believed in, or you believe there are multiple gods. There's only one God. But as you look through the Old Testament, and even into the New Testament, you see people that they were praising and praying to other gods. Jehovah is making it very clear. I am the only God. Don't have any other gods before me. Commandment number two, it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth below or in the water under the earth. Don't make idols. I grew up in a church where we had statues everywhere, everywhere you look, from the dashboard of your car to the church to at home, on tables, everywhere you looked, you had statues. Now, some people might not consider them idols, and if you're not bowing down to them, then technically they're not idols, but you are making a likeness. When you see uh, Jesus on a cross, when you see the Virgin Mary or, or a statue of one of the saints or whatever, this is a violation of the second commandment. Some people may have a problem with that. I grew up in a church that said it was perfectly okay to have those things. But when I matured and when I started reading the Bible and I realized, wait a minute, this second commandment here says that I can't make an idol of anything. I can't make a likeness of anything. How dare I try to make a picture or paint a painting of who Jesus looked like or make a statue of him or any kind of likeness. In our house here, there are no pictures of Jesus up on the wall. Uh, there are no crosses around my neck with a little body hanging on it. That would be a violation of the second commandment. I'm just making brief comments here, and of course I always invite you to study the scripture for yourself to make sure what you're hearing is true. The third commandment is something all of us have had a problem with, including myself, many times over. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We just shouldn't use his, his name, not just cursing, 
not just in a cursing way, but just in any old frivolous way. The name of God is holy. The name of God is precious. And we shouldn't just use it. Even saying something like OMG, when you say that phrase, that is taking his name in vain, in my opinion. Look at commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, etc., etc. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that's in them. But on the seventh day he rested and therefore he made it holy. Now this commandment today is one that's highly debated. And because you can work, and what God essentially is saying is you can work for six days, but you're going to have one day where you rest, one day that is devoted to God. God is asking for just one day for himself. There are some that still celebrate the Sabbath day, which would have been the seventh day of the week, or Saturday. There are some folks, Orthodox Jews and so on, that still go to temple. There are others, Christians, we celebrate the Lord's Day on the first day of the week. It is still a day that is dedicated to God. And it's a day that I personally, myself, if at all possible over my years, uh, I tried not to work on the Lord's Day. Along the way, I did have a couple of jobs where I had to work on a Sunday. But I took that to the Lord myself. I took it in prayer. And... and I needed to have a personal conviction that it would be okay. I remember one particular job that I had where uh, they required me that I was going to work every Sunday. This was a business that was open seven days a week, and they said, well, we don't have a lot of people that will work Sunday. People want to watch football and do whatever they do. We need you in here. And I took it to the Lord in prayer. I said, I can't commit to that first, but uh, let me pray about it. Well, they thought I was crazy. What do you mean pray about it? But I did pray about it, and I sought the Lord, and I came back to them, and I said this. I said, I cannot work for you every Sunday. What I will do to help you out is I will work every other Sunday. If that will work with your schedule, then we can come to an agreement. And so for a while, I was working every other Sunday for about six hours in the afternoon. Uh, I made it to the point where I could still go to church in the morning, work in the afternoon, uh, and, and not spend the entire day working. For me, th that, that seemed to work out, and I, it seemed to be okay with the Holy Spirit that I was doing that. But I'll tell you what happened, I think, as a result of that. About six months afterwards, they came to me and they said, we have enough personnel here, you, we remember what you said, and you no longer have to work Sundays. But if you'll work every Saturday and just come in six days a week, you can have the seventh day off. Look at that. That's how God answered my prayer, and I believe it's because I was faithful up front, and I had to do something to take care of my family. I had to have this job to work on a Sunday. I made a compromise that seemed to please the Lord, and six months later, I was off of Sunday duty. And it's just something for you to consider. So that's the first four commandments. The fifth one, in verse 12 here of Exodus 20, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged or long on the earth or in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Some people think, <laughs> erroneously, that you honor your mother and your father only while they're alive. That's No, it doesn't say that. It says, honor your father and your mother. My father has been gone for 10 years. My mother, about a year and a half. I still honor them. When I speak about them, I speak about them with respect. I speak about them with honor. I still remember them. Did I have an ideal childhood? No. Were there things my parents did uh, that I wouldn't have done with my children? Of course. We all have our own ways of raising families and so on as the Lord convicts us and where we are in our walk with Jesus. But I honor my father and my mother whenever I speak of them. Because this commandment doesn't say only while they're alive or only if you like them. Even if you and your, your parents have a, a frosty relationship, even if you don't get along, even if there's been some kind of whatever the situation is, we have a command from God to say that we are to honor them. 
Never drag their name through. So I'm never saying negative things about them. It's the same thing that a husband and wife. Would you go around bad-mouthing your spouse? You shouldn't. should never speak ill of your spouse. And we should never speak ill of the parents that God gave us. Next commandment. You shall not kill. Now, there are some people that say, oh, killing just in any old way. Well, if you look through the Old Testament, think about this. You see people that kill others all the time. You see nations go to war. Some of them were led by God. God led the Israelites into the promised land, and they did a whole lot of killing, didn't they? So you shall not kill cannot possibly mean kill as in kill in anything. It means murder. A better translation, a more accurate translation is you shall not murder. Now, in the Bible, you'll see where there are killings going on, that you don't see penalty for that. If God says, go and wipe out those Hittites and they go, there's no penalty for that. But if you see someone murder, there's actually laws against that. If you shed man's blood, your blood will be shed. There are laws against murdering people. So we want to make sure that we understand this commandment, that it has nothing to do with any old kill. When a nation goes to war, is killing justified if you're defending your land or you're defending your property? If someone is trying to break into your home and you have to defend your property and defend your wife and your children and someone steps into your property and you have to kill them, did you just kill them? Or did you murder them? You protected it. It's called self-defense. But if you go out looking for somebody to kill, that's a whole different thing. You shall not murder. Next commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Oh, not commit adultery. You say, well, I, I, don't, I haven't slept with anyone. I'm faithful to my spouse. I haven't committed adultery. Well, Jesus has something to say about that, doesn't he? In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you even look upon a woman with lust in your heart, and ladies, that goes for you too, looking at the men. If you even look at someone with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery already. Ouch. You mean I can't look at a beautiful person and admire them? God didn't say that. It doesn't say you can't look at someone or appreciate their beauty or their handsomeness or something like that. What you can't do is start lusting after them. What you can't do is start fantasizing about them. Keep playing that over and over in your head. I wonder what that would, they would be like being with them. Then you've committed adultery. It's pretty simple when you break this down and you look at these Ten Commandments. Look at the next one. You shall not steal. Oh, but you say and I say, we don't steal. <laughs> we don't steal. I, I've shared this story with you before when I was, when I was young and stupid. Uh, I used to shoplift. It was, a, it, was a, it was a kick. It was a high. And this was, this was long before, long before, long before they have all of these alarm systems. You can't get out of a store right now without an alarm going off if you didn't pay for something. Or they have uh, theft-proof packaging or something like that. Back when I was growing up, you could easily go into a store, slip something into your pocket, and off you go. Now, was I stealing? Yes. Did I have to make amends for that? Yes. Did I get caught and have to pay for that? Yes. You better believe it. I think well, it's only by the grace of God that I don't have a criminal record. Only by the grace of God. But let me share this with you. Stealing is not just going into a store and stealing merchandise. Stealing, when you think about it, think about this. Let's say you have a job. Before this COVID hit, you were going to the office every day. And you were supposed to start at 9 a.m. But every day, consistently, you were getting in 9, 10, 9, 15. Let's say you got on your job at exactly 9 o'clock. And you're only supposed to have 30 minutes for lunch, but you habitually take 40 minutes. Let me say this. If you don't make up that time, you have stolen from your company. You have stolen from your employer. Thou shalt not steal. This particular commandment doesn't mean just ripping off somebody. It doesn't mean breaking into a store and looting them or, or taking something that doesn't belong to you. It's cheating in any way. Any way you look at it, stealing is wrong. It's never justified. And as we're going through these Ten Commandments here in Exodus 20 here, I hope that you're being reconvicted the way that I'm being reconvicted. Because it, it's easy for us just to blow through this and start studying other parts of Scripture 
and and say, well, the, yeah, the Ten Commandments, I pay attention to them. But when you start going through them and you start realizing the implications, you realize, because I've realized also, that man, oh man, we are, even though we're believers, we are sinning many more times than what we think we are. And this is a good reminder for us to go through these and say, Lord, forgive me for that. Forgive me for that time that, that I saw that handsome man or that beautiful woman and I started lusting after her. Because I'm not supposed to commit adultery. And Lord, forgive me for the times that I oversleep and I, I'm supposed to be at my desk at 9 and I show up at 9.30. Lord, I stole from you. Because ultimately, all of these sins are against God and each other. And I'm going to show you that shortly. Let's look at the next one. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh-oh. No gossip. Don't tell people something about somebody else that isn't true and you know it isn't true. Don't bear false witness. You can't go around and I can't go around saying, you know, that guy's a drunk. I think that person's on drugs or whatever the case may be. He's a lousy father. You can't go around saying things like that because the law has certain things in our land called slander and libel but God gets right down to it. he's not even talking about he's not even talking about lawsuits or anything like that he simply say you should not do it don't bear false witness you don't go around saying things about people that's why gossip is so deadly that's why gossip is so bad listen it's a fact if you start a rumor or you say hey I think my neighbor is a drinker because he just sounds like he stumbles around that goes down the lane, it goes down the lane, and by the time it comes back around to you, he's a full-blown drunk and a junkie, and he beats his wife and all this, and all of these things you never said, because that's what happens when you gossip. It's what happens when you bear false witness. By the time you hear that story back again, it's like, Man, I didn't say that. I simply said, I think he drank too much. You see my point? We all need to be careful with that, and I am being transparent. Yes, Sister Tawana, I am transparent because how are you supposed to believe me how are you supposed to respect me as a pastor or a bible teacher or even want to tune into these broadcasts if i'm just going to make things up if i'm not going to share something about myself with you and show you that hey i'm in the same boat you are i am a sinner saved by grace and it's only by the grace of god that i'm not on my way to hell because some of the things that i've done in my life let's look at the next one because now we can't bear false witness at all let's look at the next one you shall not, look at this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, female servant, his donkey, his ox, anything that belongs to your neighbor. Of course, some of the context here is Old Testament, okay? I don't know anybody that has ox. I don't know anybody that has a donkey right now. But the point of the matter is this. I'm not supposed to covet those things. If my neighbor down the street or my brother who still lives in Pennsylvania, has a bigger house than me, then am I supposed to covet that? Am I supposed to want that so badly that I become jealous of him or I try to plot my way into his life? If my brother or my sister or anyone is making more money than me, has a higher position than me, am I supposed to covet that so much that my life is meaningless without getting to their status? That's what that's talking about. And it goes along with the Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet, again, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife. You shall not bear false witness to any of that. Okay, so we're looking at this and we're not coveting. And we're thinking about that. The Apostle Paul, and I've taught on this before, the Apostle Paul tells us, he had to learn the hard way, you know. He tells us in Philippians, Philippians 4, that he learned to be content in any circumstance, whether he was in want or he was in plenty, whether he had a lot or he had a little, whether he was doing good on his missionary journeys or he's getting himself beat up and thrown into prison. Paul found a way to be content. And I challenge you on this. And this is not easy. I admit it. Not easy. If you can find yourself being content in wherever God has you right now, you can knock out these last commandments here and make it easier on yourself by not keeping up with the Joneses, 
by not coveting what your neighbor has. Okay, he's got a fancier car, so what? Okay, he's got a bigger house, so what? They're all material things. Oh, he got the promotion and you didn't? Well, if you're going to let that fester inside of you, you're going to come up with jealousy and hatred and all of these ugly things that we're not supposed to be as Christians. I, I felt it important because now we're going to go to another part because you'll notice the title of this sermon, you say, and that doesn't make sense. Turning 10 into 2. What in the world does that mean? I'm going to show you now. And thank you for your indulgence in just walking through the Ten Commandments with me. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 22. It's a section of scripture where Jesus has to answer question after question from these people that are coming after him. First, he's dealing with the Sadducees, and then he's got to deal with the Pharisees. And you'll recall that earlier in the chapter, they were talking to him about, uh, you know, who, who, if you're paying your taxes, and he talks about rendering Caesar's what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. Then the Sadducees come after him and they say, hey, you know, uh, there's this there's this woman here who uh, marries a guy and then her husband dies, she marries another one, he dies, marries another one. When she gets to heaven, whose wife is he is she going to be? So he deals with that. And then he, he takes care of the Sadducees, he shuts them up, and then the Pharisees come along in verse 34. And this is where I want to pick up. This is where Jesus turned the Ten Commandments into two commandments. He consolidated them. Okay, we're going to go over this and then we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Verse 34 of Matthew 22 says this, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, and he, he had just silenced them, read the whole chapter, folks, read the whole chapter, he had just silenced them by saying, you know, whose wife this woman would be when she married seven brothers and all. He, he was so perfect in his teaching, they couldn't rebut him. They had not, once he gave the answer, they couldn't refute anything. The Pharisees were going to try one more time. Look at this. When they had heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. They're plotting. They're gathering together. What do we do now? What can we tell Jesus? What can we ask him? Verse 35 of Matthew 22. One of them, a lawyer, asks Jesus a question, testing him. You don't test God. You don't test God. You, it's just something you don't do. We can question God. We can wonder, God, why are things happening? Or why aren't you answering my prayer? Whatever the case. What we don't do, we don't test God. But this Pharisee, <laughs> being the uh, pompous religion man, religious man that he was, tests Jesus. Look at this. He says in verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says in verse 37, he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Now, here's where Jesus turned ten into two. He is saying here, because he has a twofold answer, he says the greatest and the first, the most important commandment is loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and elsewhere Jesus also adds all of your strength. Okay? Now, the other day, I think it was Bible study, we were looking at John the Baptist and we were looking at the fact that all of the people from Judea came out to be baptized. And I told you then that the word all it is one of those words that you need to study the context. You always want to study the Bible in context. If Once you start lifting a verse out here and a verse out there and saying, ah, that's what it means, that's when you have fallen on your face and guaranteed you will have the wrong you will have the wrong interpretation. Happens every time. You've got to read the Bible in context. Well, here, Jesus is saying that little tiny word, all. Now, the other day, when we were looking at John the Baptist, we found out that all doesn't always mean all, meaning everyone, exclusive. In this context, with this context, with God, when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, in this case, it is obvious, it is a no-brainer that we must love God with everything that's in us. God wants it all, not part of it. You don't just worship God on Sunday because it's the Lord's Day. You don't worship God and praise God and believe in God simply when things are going well. You better be on your knees and praising Him even when things aren't going well. We are to love God with everything that's in us. God created us to have fellowship with us. God loved us so much that he gave Jesus, who died on the cross, who paid for our sins, 
so that we could be together forever, for eternity with God. That's how much he loves us. God doesn't need us. God wants us. God desires a relationship with us. And he provided it through Jesus. And so when Jesus says the greatest and the most important commandment there is, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. Now, how did Jesus combine that down? If, we go, if you go back and look at the Ten Commandments, and I challenge you to do that later, we won't do that now. The first four commandments have to do with loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Not having other gods before him. Not taking the Lord's name in vain, keeping holy the Sabbath day, and not making an image. Those first four commandments have to do with this. So Jesus consolidated those first four commandments into one. There's the first one. But then Jesus is not finished. Stay with me here. Then he goes to verse 39 in Matthew 22, and he says, The second commandment, or the second most important, is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, that's the other six commandments. So from honoring your father and your mother, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not covet your neighbors, you shall not steal, you shall not murder. All of those have to do with how we treat one another. So now Jesus has taken the second six commandments and reduced that down to one. He's turned ten into two. He turned ten into two. And so... This, this smart-alecky Pharisee that decided he wanted to test Jesus, well, boy, did he get an earful, didn't he? He wanted to know which the greatest commandment was. So Jesus gave him two. And it happened to encapsulate all of the Ten Commandments. We can't just pick and choose. And some people may say, well, oh, okay, so we don't actually have Ten Commandments that we have to follow anymore. We just have to follow two. Well, if you want to look at it that way, sure. You look at the first one, loving God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. But then you have to go back to the Ten Commandments and say, oh, but that includes the fact no other gods, don't use the Lord's name in vain, etc. And, and then I'm supposed to love other people like myself. Hey, I love people. I'm not a racist. I'm not prejudiced. I love people. I don't kick, I don't kick dumb animals. You know, I don't mistreat kids. I blah, 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 blah. And we go on and on and on. I don't do this. I don't do that. So I love other people. Do you really? Well, go back to the commandments. Do you steal? Have you committed adultery by looking at someone and lusting after them? Come on now. I know I'm not just talking to myself here. So if you really want to love other people like yourself, it's otherwise known as the golden rule. You treat others as you want others to treat you. You don't want to be cheated on. You don't want to be a murder victim. You don't want to have somebody coveting what you have and try to bilk you out of your money or try to one-up you because your wife is more beautiful or you have a bigger house or whatever the, whatever the case may be. We're to love others as ourselves. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the world we would live in? Can you imagine the world we would live in if we just, all of us, would pay attention and obey the Ten Commandments? What a world we would live in. Would it still be a sin-cursed world? Yes. Would it still be a fallen world? Yes. Would it still be a world where God is going to destroy this present world and rebuild it with a new heaven and a new earth? Yes. But how much better would it be how much more nicer could we be to one another? How much more honor could we bring to Jesus Christ? How much more motivation would we all have to share the gospel knowing that Jesus could come back anytime? So Jesus takes Ten Commandments and he narrows them down into two. Now don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Don't misunderstand. We are still to obey the Ten Commandments as well as any other commandment that God gives us. We're to obey the Bible. We're to obey the commandments of God. We're to obey the Word of God. We can't pick and choose. Some things are more relevant in today's world, but the Bible is still alive and well, and the Bible is still God's rule book. It's law book. This is what we live our lives by. Now, Jesus adds, a, and I'll just I'll end this real quick because I, I want to be mindful of our time. In verse 40 of Matthew 22, he says, On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And another time we can get into that more. But essentially what Jesus is saying is, 
uh, on these two commandments, it's the whole law. Now, we know the law is the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah. It's the first five books of Moses. We have Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, known as the law. But in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament Bible, in the Jewish Bible, they also had a section called the Prophets. It was Isaiah, Nehemiah, and all the rest of the books. Because in the Old Testament, in our, in our Protestant Bible, we have 39 books of the Old Testament. If you look at the Jewish Old Testament, it has 22 books. There's more books combined. It's known as the Law and then the Prophets. The Law and the Prophets. So Jesus was telling this Pharisee, who would have known better, because a Pharisee would have been an expert in the Old Testament. They would have studied the Law. They would have understood exactly what God said. He's saying to them, on all of the, these two commandments, if you can understand what Jesus is saying, these two commandments have are, are encapsulating the entire law you can go anywhere in the old testament and you will find that these two commandments must be obeyed and it carries over into the new testament jesus turned 10 into two i pray that this i don't know it's not really sorry i guess it was a bible lesson whatever this was tonight i pray that it blessed you i really do pray that it blessed you and if it did isaiah 55 11 tells us why God's word does not return void. This was meant for somebody tonight. It just didn't convict me tonight. It convicted somebody here tonight who needed to hear the Ten Commandments again. And maybe there's an area or two or a commandment or two that you're having an issue with. Well, now's the time to get right with God. Now's the time to say, God, I'm having a problem with this commandment or I repent of that. If this has helped you, please share the video with other people. Like I said at the beginning, if this message, not only just share it with people, put a like on it if you're on the YouTube side. Whether you're watching me on Facebook, whether you're watching me on Twitter, wherever you're seeing me, put a like on it on, on the uh, YouTube page. Please subscribe to our YouTube page. And also invite other people. To, we're up to four broadcasts a week, and Lord willing, I hope to do more. But we want to see more traffic come in here. And please, if uh, God leads you, if you would do your part in helping this ministry to grow. Bereans, you know what I'm going to say to you already. Acts 17, 11 tells us that God's word does not return void, reaches all those people he intended to reach in Isaiah 55, 11. But then in Acts 17, 11, it tells us to hear the word, but then we are to study the word to make sure what we're hearing is true. So Bereans, Acts 17, 11, you've heard the word. Hopefully you've received it with eagerness the way they did. Now you have to go and search the scriptures daily to make sure that what you just heard, whether it's from me or anyone else, what you heard is true. Lastly, may I thank you, and I've been in touch with many of you recently, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for those who are standing through the ministry at this critical time. And yes, we are at a critical time. We received uh, an offering in today. You know who you are. Thank you for sending that. We recently have had a couple of offerings sent to us. We have four different ways that you could send an offering if God would lead you. This is not a ministry where you have to pay for anything. But I leave it between you and God. If this ministry is blessing you, if these Bible lessons, if, the, if those of you who have been following me for years, uh, that have been watching these broadcasts, if you've learned something from the Bible, if you've been convicted, if you're being blessed, I would ask you very humbly to consider supporting this ministry financially. We need it. I'm being honest. I'm being transparent. We could use it. We're trying to do more things for God. In this critical time as we've moved away from our previous church and we're moving into new ministries, and there are a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes right now that I can't say yet because we can't launch them yet. But if God would lead you to support us financially, we, you could do it through our cash app. You could do it through PayPal. You could do it through Facebook Messenger, Facebook Pay. And uh, the offering that came in today came right in through the regular mail. But I leave that between you and God, whatever it is you would do. I'm just glad we're together. I'm just glad that, that God has given us the YouTube channel and the Facebook Live and Twitter uh, and other social platforms that we can get into so we can be together, especially during this time of COVID-19 where many churches still aren't meeting. If you don't have a church home, if you don't have a church family, if you're looking for something, I invite you to come on back here. Make sure you're on alert so you see each time that we're on board. Reach out to me on any of these platforms. I'm always here for you to pray, counsel, whatever it is that I can do for you. But I invite you to be a part of this ministry, not only with your prayers, but financially if the Lord would lead. 
Well, I want to thank you for being with me here for this Thursday message. We will be back Sunday for the Sunday sermon, and then we'll start next week with a brand new week of broadcast. Thanks for being with me tonight. God bless you.